Hello everyone. Uh, a very good good morning to our viewers joining us live today uh, from United States. A very good afternoon to our friends in Europe and good evening to our friends in Asia and Asia Pacific region. So uh, this is a new um, this is a new initiative uh, by IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society. Uh, we are calling them as live public lectures where we are bringing in different field experts, different uh, established professionals uh, to talk to the, the, the audience and uh, convey the advanced scientific engineering uh, technology innovations in a more uh, uh, in a more simple way. And uh, we had our first lecture with the um, astronaut Robert Thursk, uh, which was very well received. So now today we have another special guest. Because, uh, today our guest is the one who enables those technologies so that astronauts can actually go into space. So uh, Gautam, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, a very good morning to you. Thank you, Tushar, and thank you, Aisha. So. Uh, before uh, before we start our, uh, our session for today, I would like to let our uh, viewers know that this event is being live broadcasted on um, uh, on, on on our Facebook uh, page, IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society page, uh, uh, on um, uh, different other different pages of uh, different regions within IEEE, and also I think India page in in India. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to have your question posted in the chat box. Q and A chat box, which you see on the bottom right hand side uh, of your chat window. So uh, to start with, I think um, you know, um, I mean, Gautam has been a very inspiring um, mentor. Uh, uh, you know, uh, senior. We have, we look look forward to. He, I have been meeting him uh, in various various um, conferences, and uh, he has been always encouraging. So I would like to take some opportunity and time to uh, introduce him. Um, so. Gautam grew up in the outskirts of Kolkata uh, in India. He does, did his undergrad studies at the Bengal Engineering College uh, and master's at the University of Virginia and PhD at California Institute of Technology, Caltech. He's currently a senior scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and also a visiting professor at Caltech. He's also a BEL professor at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and, a, and an adjunct professor at IIT Kharagpur. He developed instruments for space exploration encompassing the areas of astrophysics, planetary science, and earth sciences. He has published more than 350 journal and conference proceeding papers. And I have been reading some of them. And they are hard to understand because there's so much technical depth you have. So when you start as a student, you really have to push yourself. And uh, he has also has more than 15 patents uh, he has received more than 35 NASA Technical Achievement and New Technology Innovation Awards. He's a fellow of IEEE, IETE, and IEEE Distinguished Lecturer. So, Gautam, uh, once again, thank you so much. And uh, it has always been a pleasure listening to your talks, reading your papers, and meeting you in conferences. As a young professional, I always admire your energy level and commitment in you know, promoting science and promoting engineering. So, uh, maybe I would like to you know, take you to a flashback and um, take you to your young days, you know, tell us about your journey, uh, which you started from India as a kid and what inspired you on this scientific path. Thank you, Tushar, again, uh, and thank you, Aisha. Before I start, I want to actually acknowledge the two individuals who uh, are organizing this, Tushar and Aisha. Uh, they are my heroes. You know, you guys are so enthusiastic and, you know, in the spirit of volunteerism that it is amazing. So I look up to you and that's what makes me hopeful. Uh, so again, if anyone who are listening in, into that, uh, this uh, event is organized by IEEE MTT Society. So uh, if you are not a member of IEEE, uh, become a member and become an um, MTT Society member, mtt.org then there are a lot of uh, you know, advantages to that. So now having said that, let's uh, talk about my journey from Novogram to NASA. So as Tushar mentioned, I grew up in a small village outskirts of, of Kolkata, it's called Novogram. And uh, we are six brothers and sisters. And we, like many of you who are attending this, we, um, we also had a very uh, you know, poor background. 
We did not, uh, we lived in a one bedroom house. Uh, it was, you know, uh, 14 feet by 12 feet room. That's where we grew up. And so sometimes we did not get two full meals a day. And, but, you know, uh, one thing I always tell people that it does not take uh, much to dream. Uh, one should always dream, dream big. Sometimes uh, when, you know, when you are hungry, you cannot fall asleep. So it used to happen to us uh, and, you know, lying on the bed and looking in the uh, roof, asbestos roof, I used to think big. I used to think about, you know, uh, going to NASA and going to, uh, to Caltech. So, you know, and, you know, our just immediate past uh, director of JPL, he used to say one thing is uh, called dare mighty things. So I used to dare mighty things because I used to think that, you know, I am working with all these great people. And for that, one has to work hard as well. So I, uh, you know, I, for my parents, they always told one thing that for people like us, and people who are listening in, you know, there are many people, students out there who face the same kind of situation, same kind of conditions, you know, that not enough infrastructure, not enough facilities. But to them, I always say, dream big and work hard for it. And there will be obstacles on your way, but, you know, you will be able to overcome. You know, you will be able to reach where you want to reach. So I, I always believed in that. And another thing is, I now work in an organization. Yeah, you know, the motto of that organization is failure is not an option. If you have watched the movie, uh, you know, uh, Apollo 13, there, there is one sentence that always, you know, I still get goosebumps whenever I hear that, that is failure is not an option. And if you think about it, what is going on around the world right now, all these, you know, peaceful marches that is going on in United States, as well as in other countries, there also we have to know that failure is not an option. Failure of not addressing this inequality and injustice around the world it is not an option anymore. We'll have to come together as a human being, all of us, and address those issues. So from there, so that's how you know, dreaming big, I moved from Novogram to NASA. So, uh, Gautam, that's very interesting because, I mean, a lot of uh, young people uh, uh, joining us live today from different parts of the world. Many of us have this different aspiration as we are growing up, but uh, sometimes there are so many hard challenges because, you know, uh, you, you, you need right mentorship in life. So, uh, when you were a high school student, were you clear uh, or did you have this plan that, yeah, I want to go and work for NASA in future? Like when when every any child is growing up, they admire to be an astronaut because I mean they have you have been watching movies, you have been watching all these reading all these uh, fancy articles. So what when did you started having that motivation of uh, joining uh, NASA and when you, were you a high school student then and how you uh, carved your path because I uh, you you were you did your BE then you did your masters. So tell us about the steps uh, which helped you to reach there. Yes, uh, it, it's very true. Actually, when uh, as an undergraduate student and even as a high school student, you have a lot of dreams, but we don't really know uh, the path that, we, you know, how to get there, right? That, you know, there is no manual really to, uh, you know, to guide you through that. So one has to do is you have to read about it. At the time when I grew up, there was no internet. So on, uh, only way to, uh, you know, read about or, and learn about things is through newspapers and stuff like that. So, but I had this dream and I wanted to go there, not as an astronaut. I never really wanted to become an astronaut. For NASA, for me, it was about science because for, you know, space is such an important uh, and exciting area because we look up in the sky and we see all these, you know, stars, billions of stars. And I, I tell people, you know, that in our uh, galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, we have about 100 billion stars. And there are about 100 billion galaxies in our universe. So if you, you know, do your math, you'll realize that how many stars are there in this universe? And how, how are they formed? You know, where do they come from? What is the history behind that? So it is to excite me a lot, you know, about space. And that way, I, after my undergraduate, I joined an institute in India called TIFR. Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. This is one of the most amazing place 
uh, there and I met amazing people there, you know, who they're very smart and that opened my eyes, you know, that gave me uh, the necessary uh, skills and some of, you know, that pathways that how I can fulfill my dream. So that's where things started forming more in a concrete way. And I, I mean, I think uh, the same happened to me because when I got uh, selected for visiting summer research program, which TIFR runs, that's where my vision was like, oh my God, like there's so much to science and uh, so much to engineering and you meet experts from all the parts, uh, different parts of the world. So uh, that's very interesting. So also got them like, uh, tell us about like, how was, uh, where did you drive inspiration? Because sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, being born and raised in an Indian uh, uh, India, I have heard like we have seen that India is a very competitive country and parents want their children to go and pursue engineering and be the best. So who, who was your motivation? I read uh, somewhere in your article about a quote which your mother told you. So tell us something about that, that because that yeah, can yes. drive you, right? So in a way, you know, that one of the reason that I actually uh, go around the world now and talk to people, talk to students, is to, you know, uh, trying to, uh, you know, show them some kind of, at least in my in small way, that uh, what is possible. We did not have that kind of opportunities, unfortunately, because where I was growing up, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to meet people who uh, will be able to motivate. But in a way, our, our school was not a great school. We did not have any facilities almost, but there are some teachers who used to really motivate us. One science teacher I had, he used to talk about all these big scientists, you know, Niels Bohr, what he used to do, you know, or, and, and Rutherford and all those people. So, and then that's how the motivation came. But in a way, many of us will have to get self-motivated because uh, when you do not see a real role model in front of you, you do not get to meet someone, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Abdul Jet, APJ Kalam and someone like him. So then, uh, self motivation is the driver in such cases. Correct. Correct. So um, also tell us, like, uh, when you were applying for your master's program at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, how did you choose? Uh, how did you end up being uh, being at Virginia Tech? But what did you plan, and uh, what was the process for that during that? Yeah, so, so basically, you know, again, as I said, that there is no internet, so there was not much information. <laughs> you have to. Uh, you know, uh, I know many of you who are uh, listening to that, you cannot even believe a world. How can a world exist without internet? But it did exist uh, before. And then uh, that was, you have to write letters. Uh, so uh, that's how I actually contacted some people and they were very much interested. And, uh, you know, the, I got a uh, reply from University of Virginia, my uh, you know, PhD, uh, sorry, master's thesis advisor, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Bobby Weichel he wrote to me and he showed a lot of interest. So I, uh, that's how I actually landed up uh, at Virginia. And then from there, uh, I, I had always a dream about Caltech, as I said, uh, because I read about Feynman, Feynman lecture series and you know, all this stuff. So I uh, applied to Caltech. I just, as I said, I dared mighty, mighty things and I just said, why not? You know, right. I got to lose. And I applied and I got lucky. I got admission to Caltech. I came here and that changed my life in many ways, many respects. Correct. So when you were studying at Caltech and doing your PhD, tell, tell us something about your PhD days. Like how, com because Caltech is a very competitive place, one of the best schools in the world. Uh, tell us uh, about some of the stories as a PhD student, like what helped you to be more productive in your research and how you kept progressing in, in your academic life publishing papers so and uh, and and your supervisor so tell us some some something about uh, your phd journey so uh, if at page as i said i came to caltech i came to do my phd in electrical engineering but you know caltech is amazing place what they do is that there is you can have your advisor from any other department it need not be from electrical engineering so i my advisor was in the physics department so his name is professor jonas mudzianas and of course, he's the, one of the smartest men I have ever, ever met. And I used to sit uh, in the physics building uh, and there uh, every uh, winter, uh, Stephen Hawking used to come uh, to spend uh, his time at Caltech. And he used to sit two doors uh, from my office. Uh, and I, of course, I used to see him, I used to talk to him and all these Caltech physics professors like, you know, uh, John Preskell, 
and then uh, the people who got a Nobel Prize recently, right. uh, yeah, you know, days to come and uh, talk to uh, Stephen Hawking. So that way I got exposed to people who are, uh, you know, physicists, big name physicists. And uh, in a way that what I work on at NASA, we build instruments, right? However, the way NASA works is very different. So everything is science driven. We'll have to actually, there has to be a science. We are trying to answer some big science questions. And then what kind of measurement that we need to do to answer that science question? And then what kind of instruments we need to build to uh, you know, do that measurement? So that's how, that is the path for NASA. And you know, at Caltech, those environment in the physics environment uh, that helped really uh, me in, in formulating what I want to do and where I want to go. Right. So uh, uh, space, I, I guess, is like a confluence of many fields. Uh, you can be a computer scientist, you can be an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, civil engineer, you work with people from physics, chemistry, bi biology. So a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of questions which often comes to us is that, uh, you know, I'm studying XYZ branch. Can I, can I work for NASA or can I work for uh, uh, European Space Agency or can I work for Indian Space Agency? So tell us about the multidisciplinary nature of the field you work in. Uh, yes, so this is very important because always, you know, when I give lectures to students, uh, particularly you know, schools uh, kids, uh, one of the questions they ask me is, um, how to become a, a rocket scientist? Because people always think about people who are uh, working in space is uh, their rocket scientists. So I tell them, of course, you need the basic STEM subjects, right? Uh, you know. Uh, that is math, science, people work on, but you need a lot of other skills. So we have, this is a big tent, space, NASA, ESA, ISRO, these are big tents. We need people from all walks of life. We need, uh, you know, uh, we need people who are art, who are very good in art. We need uh, people who are good writers because, and for us as well. So at the end of the day, if you are doing research, if you are doing science, you are building instrument, then, you'll have to explain that, you'll have to explain to people, you'll have to be a good speaker, right? You'll have to uh, have all different disciplines are, are come together to make it happen. It is not an individual one stream uh, area because we need people from all walks of life. So that's why I tell people that whatever you're working on, you can join NASA, it doesn't matter. Only thing, only one requirement, you have to be good at it. Very correct. Because, uh, for an example, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't come from an English speaking country, you know, uh, when I wrote my first paper, first transaction paper, I was almost crying after like one month, two months, three months, just, you know, how to write it, write is also an art. So, so basically, uh, personally, I have seen that it's just not about, you know, technical skills are your core, but apart from that, you have to excel in different interpersonal uh, skills and eventually evolve over time so uh, with this uh, so when you were graduating of course you know when you grad graduate from caltech you have offers for very high paying jobs uh, you have you can go to silicon valley silicon valley culture was has always been very attractive so why what was your motivation going from caltech having a degree in hand with companies standing on your door and leaving that and going to a path which is full of, you know, technical challenges and, you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, what was your motivation after, uh, after PhD to join, to join JPL and work for that? So, uh, you know, how did it happen is that, of course, as I said, I always wanted to go to NASA, but I actually did not apply. I was writing up my thesis and then thinking, okay, as I was writing that, okay, I'll have to do something. And then I, one day I got a call, a call from, uh, from Peter Siegel, he was my boss at, at JPL when I joined in. So he said, okay, I, I read uh, about your papers and all, so do you want to come over for, um, uh, you know, give a talk to our group? So, uh, and I went over there, gave a talk and met some people. And then I, uh, I was uh, made an offer uh, to join in. And uh, to be honest, that uh, salary was, uh, you know, much less than what uh, I already had been, you know, contacted by a few companies. In much less, in less than 50 percent, <laughs> I uh, did not hesitate for a second because, you know, uh, at, you know, I don't know about others, but for me, 
there you need some uh you know of course some money you need in your life uh but i have gone through my uh, in my experience in life has been that you know whatever i get is much better than what i had before so i did not hesitate for a second i uh, i accepted that and uh, from there i started working in nasa and then that has been the best even today i sometimes don't uh, you know feel that oh i'm here you know uh, the journey that i had so it's kind of is, is that i'm still dreaming those dreams that i used to so that's kind of feeling i have sometimes great great so uh, now uh, be, tell us like we have uh, talked about your personal trajectory how you reached nasa so now tell us something about uh, the kind of work you do in nasa like what are the technical areas you are working on and what is the importance and relevance of those uh, engineering uh, innovations which you are doing at jpl uh, in the context of modern science and physics and experiments yeah so this is very important because you know that we uh, we develop technologies and sometimes we think that oh i have a very cool technology oh this is great but for nasa perspective you can have the best technology in the world but if you are not doing some scientific research out with that then then there is not much value so whatever we do as i said is science driven so we we'll, we are trying to answer some big science question i'll give an example because i'm working on uh, some instrument uh, in, instrumentation development that has relevance to that that one of the thing that scientists believe that when uh, our, we did the comets brought water to earth so that is one of the science uh, you know uh, question but if i tell you that that okay yes comets brought water to earth you are going to say okay how do you prove that right so what is the way to you know prove uh, that um, uh, you know that question one of the thing is that if you look around the water that we drink every day is h216o so, uh, you know the 16th uh, oxygen isotope and but there are other kinds of water we have water h217o h218o hdo that you know on deuterium and if you actually take the, a ratio of the abundances of different kinds of water on planet earth you will find that those ratios matches with some of the comets like it's called jupiter family comets with that so the then question becomes okay if we can go to some comets and do that measurement and see that the ratios are very similar, then we can actually more or less say, yes, this is the source, because the ratio has to be, it will be same if the source is the same. So to do that, how do you go about that? How do you then build an instrument to answer that question? I work in the area of terahertz, it's very high frequency. You know, can, you explain, can you explain just terahertz to the people, you know, uh, yes. what is terahertz? That's right. If you terahertz is actually uh, 10 to the power 12, one, you know, 10, you know, the gigahertz is uh, 10 to the power nine hertz, right? So terahertz 10 to the power 12, you know, hertz, that is one terahertz. And why it is important? Because uh, it, it goes back to that, the beginning of the universe. If you look in the sky, you, look, you see the stars, that is the optical, right? The frequencies that you are receiving are optical because our eyes see in the optical domain. However, actually the universe is brightest in the terahertz frequencies, actually peaks at three terahertz because all these galaxies, all these you know, stars, they're radiating at all different frequencies. However, through the interstellar medium, you know, there are some dusts, the dust absorbs and then they re-radiate re and then they preferentially radiate in this frequency band. And that's why if you want to know how stars are formed, how this universe came about, you'll have to look in the terahertz frequency band. Even now, if you look at how new stars are born, how new galaxies are formed, so in this frequency band, so that's why it's very, very important area of research. And I work in that area, and I was just telling you that instrument that I'm working on, I'm building a very small, high-resolution spectrometer It's uh, you know, that can fit in, in a very small platform, like a CubeSat or a small set, and that can go to yes so basically shoebox size satellite so that can go to a comet and trying to measure those that water ratios and tell you that oh yes to answer that it's one of the idea so i'm working on multiple instrument developments in astrophysics uh, as well and as well as going instrumentation for mars you know to measure the wind on mars I, by developing some instrumentation for that because we do not have good knowledge 
on the wind on Mars because as the you know rover or lander they uh, go to the to the atmosphere uh, and Mars has a lot of you know you know high winds sometimes and wind gusts but we don't know so if you suppose think about it our you know Mars 2020 that will be launched soon uh, that if uh, the wind gust comes and it takes it to somewhere else and it goes belly up then that's it our you know uh, expensive yeah. instrument uh, gone down the drain so we need to know those things so we are i i am working on some of these instrumentation development as well so to uh, for our viewers you know just to uh, give a context of terahertz the current um, uh, our wireless communications which we were having they are like 2.6 3.5 gigahertz so gotham is working on something which is 500 times higher than those frequency which we use right now you know so uh, it's a very niche area and uh, you need a lot of expertise so Gautam when you are building these instruments right um, what type of discipline people you need for them because you might be very good uh, antenna engineer I might be some uh, amplifier designer so what are different disciplines which uh, come together to build some kind of a platform uh, I, I, as I said that's one of the things that I will have to really interact with scientists you know that uh, you know science Chemist, chemists who actually know about the chemistry of this, physicists and everyone, that is the science aspect of it. But in terms of other disciplines, we need all kinds of engineers. So microwave engineers are very much needed because of our instruments and microwave and, and terahertz. We need mechanical engineers like Aisha. Aisha is a, a trained in mechanical engineering because we have to make it. You know, I remember that when I first did my drawing, mechanical drawing, and gave it to the workshop, uh, the person was laughing at me because I uh, I knew how to draw things, you know, engineering drawing, many of us have done. Uh, but, you know, what is possible? What are the tolerances? Those aspects of it, you really need to uh, know about. So you'll have to have a broader understanding. You know, we focus sometimes too much on depth, Yes, you need the depth of a subject. That's how becoming a subject matter expert. But at the same time, if you are trying to build some instrumentation, if you are leading a team to develop something, you have to understand multiple areas. Uh, I, I, I need to understand the science aspect of it because uh, then what are the things, what are the error bar that my instrument can provide so that the measurement can be done? So that I need to understand. I need to understand the mechanical aspect of it. I need to understand all uh, different aspects, thermal, you know, thermal engineering is such a big issue. So we need to have people who are of all, all multi, this is a multi this is not a thing, you need teamwork. One of the things I keep telling people that teamwork is one of the most important aspect of it. So form a team, you know, you cannot do everything by yourself. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, so Gautam, uh, with, the, with the technical work you are doing and um, uh, tell us like, uh, of course, you know, every day and every project you are starting, unlike many other research areas, where already a lot of research has been done. You are the first ones in the entire world to demonstrate what you are doing uh, at JPL. So tell us about like, um, how challenging is it, especially in your mindset, you know, like attitude building. Uh, when you have a problem, what should be the right attitude to approach that problem? And that can be even, you know, in personal lives, because it's just about the uh, attitude within you, which takes you far. So uh, tell us about how uh, difficult those challenges are and uh, some stories where, you know, you try, 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 maybe you failed, maybe you succeeded, you know, many a times it happens. So tell us some stories about um, uh, in your technical domain, when you are trying something which hasn't been done before, what is that, um, you know, cycle? Yeah, so basically, if you're in the research world or, or technology development world, and that is failure is part of life. So what you hear when you read a paper, uh, that paper is about success story, most of it, right? 99.9% success story. What you don't hear is the failures uh, that we, we, we have. And every day we fail in some form or the other. Uh, and that is, that is part of life, you know, that we want to do something uh, and we, it does not work. So don't despair. My uh, always, um, you know, my attitude has been that okay, this is part of life, but as long as we can uh, learn from this failure, so you'll have to really analyze in your mind what went wrong. You know, in in at, at JPL at NASA, we have something called lessons learned. So there is a always, you know, whether it's successful or you know a failure, we always go back and see what are the lessons that we have learned 
from uh, from this. This is actually very true for every aspect of life, not only for NASA or not only for space industry, for every industry. They will have to realize what are the lessons that we have learned from this. So failure will happen, but innovation is one of the things. You cannot really, as you know, one of the you know, word in the title of this is innovation, because you cannot go out and say in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, say, let's innovate something. So it does not happen that way, right? Innovation happens that you face challenges, you see that you have some problem to be solved, and then how do you solve it? You think about it, you form a team. You know, that's again, come back to the theme of team building, because uh, to be a leader, I always say you'll have to be a good listener. So that is the main part of a leadership. So if you are leading an effort to develop something, so you'll have to be a good listener, you listen to ideas, and then, you know, talk to people, uh, and then the new ideas come, right? That you actually talk about this, and, you know, that's why it is so important to, you know, uh, talk talk around to people who are not really necessarily working in your uh, you know area of expertise because you can get ideas from others and that's how innovation happen you know and that is the key to you know success that you have to innovate you have to actually find what is innovation innovation is that you have to find uh, a, you know a solution for some problem uh, that we we see and, and that kind of innovation is actually i tell that it is not that it is happening only in space or in other industries it's happening everyday life if you are uh, passionate about cooking you go to your kitchen and you see that you are trying to make some good meal and it doesn't work <laughs> it happens <laughs> to all of us right and then what do you do you know that you try to find out so i tell that you know all of us my definition of scientist is very different than many others i say all of you, everyone is a scientist because we are trying to figure out how things work. Correct. You know, and that's that is the that's way you know that is innovation. You have to become the make it a part of your everyday life, and that's when you know good things will happen. That's my personal belief. I, I completely agree, and I, I remember I think it's a uh, quote from Henry Ford that. Failure uh, gives you opportunity to begin ag again with more intelligence. So, and that's where uh, that uh, habit of innovation starts uh, with time. So this is very interesting, uh, the discussion we had so far. So I also read in some of the news articles, um, I, I know you are an avid world traveler. Um, uh, there was a time uh, in my life where I used to see Gotham more than I see my parents. And uh, all, many conferences, many... Uh, you know meetings so uh, so you would have met people from di very diverse backgrounds different countries uh, i also heard you were in uh, there was a news about um, uh, that uh, there might be you might be involved with some terahertz chip in shukriyan mission uh, going with indian space agency so is there a collaboration of different space agencies and type of work you do like for example isro nasa isa uh, how does that all ecosystem work so it, it is very important in, in the today's world space is very expensive business if you think about it right so if you are not collaborating with other uh, you know uh, organizations so it like as i said teamwork not only in your organization teamwork in a global scale so if you have to think that isa nasa isro all of us will have to come together and then you know something big can happen so that is happening if you look around that is happening in a daily basis regular basis because we all understand that that is the future and not only this different government space agencies even the private ent entities as well you know the spacex and blue origin all these uh, people are making big strides and that makes us all very happy and hopeful because that's the way to go uh, you know missions are big too expensive billions of dollars so what happens in you know this kind of mission that we ask for contributions from other countries so like isro as you mentioned uh, you know venus mission they actually ask for contributions from other uh, other countries of instrument contribution is not that you cannot give money to isro uh, or i we cannot take money from any other places but we, what you do you open it up that okay we are having a mission to some place uh, to answer some of these uh, science questions so do you want to contribute an instrument so that the instrument can fly on our mission, you get that data and you disperse that information to everyone else. So that, that is the model. 
and that is the model for future that is the current model as well so you'll see more and more of this kind of collaborative efforts going on so Gautam, what is your take I, uh, from this i want to kind of move towards now what has been happening recently around us so two major things have happened in past past uh, couple of weeks first uh, our history was created when spacex launched astronaut first time you know using falcon uh, and uh, it has been amazing the way Elon Musk has taken over this entire vision and he has demonstrated for the first time commercialization of launch vehicle uh, in space segment. So how do you see this public private partnership model going forward? And also at the same time, what are the opportunities it brings for young people? So yeah, absolutely very true that again, you know, this is very important. As I said, you know, that we are so happy uh, uh, that you know, private entities, not only SpaceX. If you think, look around, there are many other private you know uh, companies. They have invested big way, and they have made big strides. You know, like Blue Origin, they have a new Shepard you know, capsule, um, you know, crew capsule. They have developed, and um, as well as you know, uh, yeah, yes, uh, and, and SpaceX uh, you know, Dragon. Uh, capsule so there are many progresses have been made over the last you know you know decade or so in this area and uh, and that is the future because if you look around if you want to work in the space industry because when the commercial entities come in so we can offload from nasa all these different space agencies they can offload some of this work uh, you know to them because the uh, company they have some uh, they develop technology uh, they make big strides. Also, they like to uh, make some uh, you know, profit out of that. So they have other motivations as well. For us, if we can get you know or offload some of these uh, work to those companies, then we can focus more on the science aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because this agency's uh, main aim is to do science, and so that's why in future, uh, you know, I, I'm so glad because more opportunities for work for the students who are working on right now. So you'll, you'll get more opportunities to come in because uh, in the, there have been limited opportunities for in the, because only there are a few space agencies around the world who are hiring in at that rate. So more companies coming, more future jobs, and that is great for all of us. I, I agree, and I mean that's also an opportunity for students, you know, who are studying right now, so that they can work hard in the in the area they are really passionate about. And then go out. In the end, it's it's a market, and you have to be strong enough so that people uh, you attract them and uh, you get good jobs, and then you can contribute in various different disciplines. So um, we have so many questions going on on Facebook Live right now. We are watching them and I'm monitoring them. So what I would like to do, I will pass it to Aisha. Aisha can ask her uh, questions, and but then I will want to go back to the audience who have been posting a lot of questions and select. Uh, some of the question and put forward to you because we are already five minutes in the session as of now. So, Aisha, uh, please go ahead, and then I will take questions from the audience. Yeah. So, um, I want to quickly uh, highlight three important things that I noticed from day one from when I met uh, Gautam. So, the first thing is uh, he uh, like he definitely spoke about how team is important. And uh, out of all the awards that you've got, uh, I happen to see that there's a repetitive theme award that you have taken. So it, uh, when we say that we have got an award, it's different. And when our team gets an award, it's, it's a collective thing. But what was standing out was most of the papers or most of the projects you have done, I've always seen a women co-author co or there is a presence of a young or whatever, like irrespective of age, there is a presence of a women in the team, irrespective of space being a difficult industry, technology being complicated. So give us some insights of, you know, how much inclusion diversity are you trying to bring in and what, what are, like, how are you trying to do about it or go about it at NASA and otherwise in life? This is a very good question, Aisha, that you brought in. In the world, 50% of the people are women. And, but we do not see uh, that that uh, you know that ratio in our work. Uh, mm -hmm. We do not see that you know in uh, you know in the leadership in all around the world. And this is such a shame because you know what we found is, is everyone knows if you talk to social scientists that better decisions are made when both men and women are involved. And uh, so in I have uh, as I said I have four sisters. 
uh, Ari, and I have one daughter. So I have grown up uh, around women at home and they, I, I know how, what their capabilities are there. And again, I want to stay, uh, say one thing very clearly that I believe very strongly that women can do anything that men can do, even they can do better. So there is uh, absolutely no doubt in my mind about that. And so I have made, you know, a conscious effort to make sure that we have women in our team. I hired a lot of, uh, you know, uh, postdocs and then uh, they became staff here. And not because I hired them, that because they were women. I, they came to us, they worked with us because they're the best in the world. You know, I have work, people working with me and they've been still, uh, you know, our new people are coming in every day. So they are so good if you look around them. So I, that, is, that is no reason not to, you know, have them in. I'm blessed that they have decided to work with me. Uh, and so it, that's, that's very important. And that's the one of the reasons I really try that. Uh, and all of us should make sure that actually that happens. We'll have to improve this situation. So, uh, Gautam, there's an interesting question as a, as a follow-up of Aisha, which is a lot of people have been asking this question. I'm watching my phone, uh, you know, in our conversation. So one question which people have is being, uh, because NASA and working for space agencies is usually very restricted. So when you say you hired uh, postdocs or you hired uh, research scientists, can you explain student community at large who is working, who come from diverse background again, not only in US, but who are in entire world, what are those paths for especially the international audience? Because you, you also came uh, from a different country. How, what are those uh, mainstreams people can look into? Like how can I target and what are those platforms where I can find information. Uh, so how does all that work? So basically, as, as I said, you know, in our organization, we hire people from all different backgrounds and ethnicity and from different countries. Uh, because that's why you can see that if you go to any of the NASA centers, you come to our group, I always show a picture of our group and you yeah. find people from all over the world uh, in, in, in that. So that's why this is a op we, NASA and all these organizations, they actually take people from. There is a, a kind of a sense outside that, oh, no, if I'm not a U.S. citizen, I won't be able to work there. That is not true. I was not a U.S. citizen when I was hired, and that's happening every single day. So there is a path to that. So we'll have to look around. There, there are a lot of job openings and a lot of postdoc opportunities. If you are doing your Ph.D., so you should go to NPP, NASA Postdoctoral Program, and there... We, that is one of the best way to come uh, to work with us uh, because you know that when we have limited number of you know uh, slots available uh, to offer to people and we everyone like we try to get the best people we also we are lucky that we actually get a very talented uh, people application pool but we also understand that no country in the world has the sole uh, you know uh, this thing of smart people <laughs> uh, that is, uh, if you go anywhere in the world, you'll find smart people. I have done, as, I, as Tushar, you had asked me this question about, you know, I have traveled uh, around the world quite a bit. And that's the one of the main things. When I do is traveling internationally is not easy because of your family also suffers, right? So, but I do because I actually go and meet those people, meet those students. And then when one of the things is that I feel that if we, I can inspire one single individual to do something, you know, that and to take up some uh, uh, something more than, you know, what they're doing, that will be so fulfilling. And that's the reason I go around. And there you find smart people everywhere. I went to Cairo, Egypt, and then the people are so smart and so enthusiastic and that they are, you know, uh, dreams in their eyes. There are the twinkle in their eyes if you look at them and then you feel yes you know I, you go them go there talk to them and encourage them and inspire them and that's what i try to do right. and that's one of the reasons i actually travel around the world as well correct correct so one thing is what we missed uh, the second point which i was uh, trying to mention because of covid a uh, lot of things have changed the way we work um, maybe you can a little bit touch on uh, how you have been working from home uh, do you, uh, how is that experience? 
and also at the same time there is a big worry uh, within everyone that the fundings for uh, education research academic research as well as for scientific research uh, in upcoming years we might see some kind of cuts in the funding and at the same time people are feeling little helpless because job market is doing pretty bad right now so in such scenario one is the motivational aspect yes we have to be motivated keep trying but what are some tangible things according to you people can try out so that they can recover from this phase so it is is very good very important because if we don't talk about covid 19 then it will be really shame because what happened is you know just early this year and late last year the our world has completely gone upside down because it's such a such a devastating you know scenario that has happened with this uh, this virus this is not even a live virus if you think about it just a strand of rna can bring the entire world on its knees uh, so that shows our our vulnerability and you know uh, it and there's i know that you know job market is really bad right now because people have been laid off and then it will take time for them to come back um, so as for us i'll talk a little bit about what we are doing and how we are coping and then but but again i can understand the pain and suffering that people are going through uh, and it is uh, you know if i tell you that tomorrow it will be all fine that is not true it is not going to be fine tomorrow but we'll have to be hopeful we'll have to find a way and there are ways that we'll come back we'll see uh, that you know we will human beings are so resilient has been so resilient we always we, we gone through in 1918 we had this kind of pandemic but you know came back here we are today so it will change it will happen but for us what we have been what is happening we are working from home for last two and a half months almost 3 months now so again we work uh in an area where what we term is a touch labor because we have to touch something we will build hardware right we'll have to go to the lab we'll have to build something to send in to out space so for people like that if you are working from home what do you do then right so what kind of work you can do but fortunately for us that we are not only building some instrument but we are also thinking about what to do next in future you know big part of nasa is that thinking ahead you know there are long term goals uh, you know that we are doing something now but that will be over so what do we do next what is the future what are we going to do in future so we have used this time we are using this time in a way that we can actually think ahead so we can plan for the future projects we can run simulations to do uh, you know stuff like a lot of things we can get done or now so we are focusing on those areas however we are also slowly opening it up because we'll have to make sure that you know safety of the people is paramount in this you'll find all around the world when people are opening it up first thing is how can you make it safe for people but still get this kind of work done right so that so lot of work is going on in all organization across the globe they are thinking that how can we make sure that when people come back we still have this physical distancing people are wearing mask things will change you know one thing is for sure that one thing that in after 911 united states change the world change you all know that so this is another such an event that the world that we knew before will completely change post covid so that that is going to happen and as you know one of the thing is that what is going to happen what as a student suppose you are a student you are look you are looking for a job now and covid happened then how do you react to this right so i always say when a lot of student they ask advice suppose they are just high schoolers they want to go to a, a, a engineering i'm a graduate they ask me what stream i should study what is the you know in future what do you think will you and on all the, these questions come i always tell them don't think about four years from now because people who had joined four years before uh, you know covid they saw something that oh everything will be great for i should go for computer engineering i should go for electrical engineering i should go for mechanical i should go for it all this kind of they planned but look at where we are now so in future there will be lot of investments in the area of healthcare correct healthcare industry so much on technology if you look around good hospital today go to any modern hospital today what do you see of course you see doctors you see nurses 
but at the same time you see all kinds of equipment Correct. and who do you think make builds those equipment all technologies all these engineers right so there will be a job you know a lot of demand for the new kind of equipment that can go to an, uh, in, in in a hospital i also read that gpl uh, right after this covid thing started they came up with this initiative and they built a open source ventilator uh, yes, so tell something yeah, about so, that. Uh, so uh, yes I, I was going to plan to talk about it if you think about it that our role we build instruments right so we have all kinds of engineers available with us and then there was a, everywhere around the world a shortage of, of ventilators so what we did you know at, at jpl is some at the team was formed immediately and they came up with an idea that we can make a ventilator that is not really for all purposes but for covid kind of ventilators, you need a specific kind. And how can you make something with off the shelf components and very low cost? Because that was the driver that we'll have to make something that people, if we give this IP, if we give the blueprint where to some companies, they can actually make these ventilators at a very low cost. And in, in a very short amount of time, we are successful in building that with testing with hospitals and then you know giving this to everyone if you want you can take it build it it costs less than three thousand dollars to build it right. that can go to any hospital less than three thousand dollars and if you actually build it some other countries you even cheaper because you know uh, the, the labor cost will be somewhat cheaper so yeah that is what we did uh, and that was you know that shows that if you are agile and if you, if you have ideas and, and your heart has to be at the right place that you actually we 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 live in a society we'll have to whatever we do we have to make sure that this aspect of it uh you know if you are not thinking about human beings why we are doing all this correct i mean advancing technology for humanity has always been has to be the key focus exactly. so uh, Gautam, there is one interesting uh comment i got um, uh we have anvesha who is a student of class 10 who is on call right now she says, I am, I know I am very young, but I got extremely inspired and motivating by your words. I learned teamwork is instrumental in all our lives. Can you please tell us how each of us can become a good team leader and can be a good player in what we do? So I think yes. so, so I really wanted to make sure I ask this question. So Anesha, thank you for joining in. Actually, uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about Anesha. Recently, I got an email from her uh you know a, a couple of days ago and she's a class 10 student she's living in dubai and she wrote to me and i was so motivated and i was so you know elated getting her email because that's what is all about the young people when uh you know they ask questions they think about all this future that gives us hope right so as as i was mentioning how do you become team leader how do you become a leader in any aspect of life? As I said, one of the key ingredient, I believe, is to of this, uh, you have to listen. Because whenever I'm in a meeting, uh, I speak the least. Uh, because I try to understand uh, what are the, what, uh, you know, people, what people have to say. Because if you let others talk, and if you listen, because most often, others are smarter than I am, <laughs> you know, and then they have so much to contribute. So that is, that's what I do. And go around, I always tell people, go around, form a, you know, with your friends. I go for coffee every day. Now I have friends, Nasser, I don't know whether you're joined here, you know, David Gonzalez is in Europe right now. I have so many, you know, they joined as a postdoc. And I also I have people in, uh, friends who are young people, but they're from all different, very different background in the sense in technology background. So I go for coffee every single day. And over that coffee, we talk about everything, you know, soccer, cricket, uh, you name it. And also sometimes we talk about technology and our problem that we are trying to solve. And there you'll find that the people come up with suggestions and we actually run with that sometimes. Quite a few of our patents came from those coffee table discussions. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we'll have to do. We'll have to actually talk to others. This human to human contact and talking is the best way. I know during the because of COVID, that's not happening. You know, I, I'm having a lot of meetings, Zoom meetings, WebEx meetings. 
But, you know, I really am looking forward to when we'll be able to go back to lab and you know, talk to face to face. And that's why, because in those dynamics are different. You are not thinking about something. You go with the one idea, you come up with completely different idea because you're talking to someone. Correct, correct. So yeah, I mean, you, I can imagine you being in a room with a whiteboard and a marker and people around you and that kind of conversation just changes the entire dynamics. And one more thing for team leader perspective, uh, Gautam, which I, I mean, I'm very younger to you, but uh, what I really liked uh, in one of your slides that your mother uh, once told you that go reach for sky, but keep your feet on the ground. So for being uh, for, for uh, like being a good human and having that humility uh, with what you achieve in life is also a key key factor when you are working in a team. Because uh, absolutely, absolutely, Tushar, you are so correct. And that way, I actually this is my life philosophy has been that you can you know you get uh, as you do well in your life and you, you work hard, you get accolades, you get awards. For me, you know, at the end of the day, those things are not that important if you think about it. Yeah, you know, what is more important is to be a good human being. Because if we, we, we live in this world, we, I am trying to be good. I don't know how, whether I am successful or not, but that's what always, you know, drives me, you know, that, that human aspect of it, about that, you know, compassion and the empathy. This is so important in, in today's world specifically. And that's what we should always strive to do because that is, again, come back to this leadership about listening to others. You know, if you see around the world what is going on, we'll have to listen. Uh, we'll have to listen and we'll have to, the main drive should be a, to do well for others, you know, to do well for human beings. And that's why, as I, as I mentioned, my mom, uh, my mother used to always say that, you know, we, of course, we used to dream and we used to do all the stuff. My mother says that, again, yes, I, I was joining NASA, right? And she said that, yes, you want to touch the sky, great, but keep your feet on the ground. I am trying. And you know, for a lot of electrical engineers, Grounding is very important. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so uh, uh, another another important thing I think a lot of uh, uh, students are asking, and I'm trying to take all the question and summarizing it uh, in a simpler form. Uh, is it real? Is it really important to be a PhD uh, to work in these kind of areas in these kind of sectors? So, for example, uh, there can be someone from India uh, who can go and work for ISRO right after undergrad. But there might be a lot of students from India who might want to work for NASA. I mean, uh, they, 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 they can try that. But what I have personally learned when you, for, for me, I, I personally, my understanding was that PhD gives you time to work on yourself. It gives you time to build those analytic abilities, which you can take to any field you want to go and excel in that particular part. So how important is PhD and uh, uh, trajectory if you want to end up being in one of the very specialized fields like you are in? So it's, it's a very good question and it's also very relevant in today's you know, COVID-19 world because that's what we are talking about. You know, that you do not need to have a PhD to work in your organizations. It, it's not because it, you, you, we, ha we have people from all kind of educational levels and we need that. The, not everyone needs to be a PhD and that is true, but I always encourage people that if there is a possibility for possibility, if you can afford uh, uh, to uh, go for higher studies, go for it, because that opens your eyes, that actually opens your horizon. Uh, if you if you forget about the economic aspect of it, because economically, if you look around, if you look at statistics, people who have PhDs, they are much more uh, on average uh, than people who don't have PhD. So if you're thinking about earning potential, it makes sense. But in general, the reason I actually tell people that to go for higher studies is because, you know, what, what does you learn? As, as you were asking that, what do you really learn in, in a PhD? In a PhD, what you learn is how to solve problem, really. So basically you get that, you know, you are given a problem which has not been solved yet. That's what the PhD is all about, something new, right? So you, uh, you start looking into that, you know where, the, where to find information where to find those tools. That's what you learn in PhD, you know, and how to talk to people and you know, solve your problems. Uh, so uh, this gives you a lot of, you know, that other tool sets, uh, access to tools that you can use in your life. So right now, as I was saying about COVID-19, because what is going to happen is that, the eco uh, because the job market will be slow. So you're not going to get hired the, at the rate that was happening before. 
So what do you do? This is a great opportunity. So it is a huge problem. Use that as an opportunity to get the skill sets that you need in when things start picking up. So that's, it. that's right. So for yourself, so you know, if you go for higher studies, do get learn something else. If you can afford, of course, some people I know they will say that, yeah, I cannot do that. I need a job today. Was I was in that kind of scenario when I graduated from undergraduate because you know I I needed a job. That's why I actually went to TIFR, worked for a couple of years, then came to uh, my higher studies. That was the reason. I know a lot of people are on that boat. Yes, for you then you have to really uh, uh, look for a job. But if you can afford to wait for one or two years to get new skills, get you know uh, you know. Uh, go for higher studies, go for masters, go for PhD. My suggestion will be do it, go for it and do it. And then you'll be much more marketable in that way. Uh, that you, your options will be many more. So I, 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 uh, I read this statement and I always keep this in back of my mind that, you know, start wherever you are and whatever you have and make something out of it because it's not that we will be only able to excel if we are in the topmost university or topmost uh, institution. The contribution has to all be always there so that, you know, you, you with every contribution you will evolve and eventually that idea of being a leader in your domain, you will establish that over, over years when you practice. So um, there, are, there will be many hurdles and all of us um, face that hurdles uh, in, our, in our lives, but we have to be self-motivated as you said. So Gautam, with this, I think we are almost uh, one hour into the session now. Uh, I would like to, um, there have been a lot of questions regarding antenna research and uh, antenna design because, uh, of course, um, uh, that is an integral part of, uh, uh, part, part of space. Uh, one question is, like, I would want to take it generic. What are key technologies, according to you, in coming five to ten years? which you will advise someone who is in high school or who is an undergrad who wants to pursue higher studies. What are those key technology you think will be changing the world in, in coming 10 years? So um, one thing I actually tell people when the, this, this question that you are asking, you know, what is going to happen in the next 10 years? Um, I, 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 have, I, I tell my answer is I don't know, to be honest, because if I, someone had asked me uh, today, sitting today, so 20 years ago, someone asked me, you know, that, okay, what do you think is going to happen? There is no smartphone, uh, I, you know, uh, this just, just started coming out. It has changed the world. Look at this, what, the way we work today, you know, in, in 20 years ago, if, some, if someone had asked me, we, we couldn't have imagined the way things have grown. So I always tell students, particularly who are in high school uh, and also undergraduate level, you, instead of thinking about what will be the big thing in next, you know, five years, 10 years, you focus on the basics mm -hmm. because you know basics they don't change if you think about it the technology changes but the underlying basic principles are not going to change so if you understand the basics very well if you look at when you're studying physics when you're studying math when you're studying chemistry whatever you are studying if you understand those basics well then you can actually change yourself mold yourself to the with the changing world the new technologies world, right? Because as I said, you know, next couple of years, you'll find that the healthcare industry will really have a lot of demand, you know, because of all these things that is happening, you know, in, in the chemistry world, in the biology world, you know, to kind of get, get a vaccine, to get new, you know, therapeutics, all, but at the same time, new tools, new technologies to actually build instruments. So you can do all this, if you actually understand your basics, yeah. mm -hmm. that's, that's my suggestion because it is difficult for me. I, I don't have the, you know, uh, you know, looking at things, I can tell, oh, this is what's going to happen. Great. No, uh, I, I, I'll be lying if I tell you that because yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I can tell you, give some thing that, okay, this, maybe these are the things will, will pan out. But like mm -hmm. 5G, 6G and all this communication it has always been a, a big driver in the, in the technology world. Of course, new smartphones will come. Uh, you know, 5G is almost here. So we'll have to, you know, 6G and beyond. Uh, so all those things will be there. But if you understand the basic as well, the underlying principle well, uh, then you'll be able to actually, you know, uh, 
learn other things as it come along. Correct, correct. We we have message from Nasir online. He's a uh, good leaders are always positive, and Adrian Tang is saying that uh, always so obnoxiously positive. So I mean. I, uh, yes. I, I talk to Nasser, Nasser a lot. Again, Nasser, thank you for joining in. Nasser is one of the uh, greatest uh, engineers uh, around the world. You know, in, in, he came uh, to JPL and he was my postdoctoral fellow. He worked with me and then he's uh, a leader in himself. So again, he's very right. You know, he com always complains that I'm too positive sometimes. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I am I'm eternal optimistic because, again, as I said, People like me, if you are not optimistic, if you are not hopeful, uh, then I won't be here where I am, my, given my background. So, yes, that is one of my assets as well, Nasser. So, uh, 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 thank you, you know, for, uh, I think it was a very well diverse discussion. We touched on various subjects. Um, before, you know, we end up, I would like to um, give you some time to kind of conclude uh, and uh, also to our audience, because there have been a lot of questions. Of course, we cannot take all the questions right now. You can always go to MTTS page, post your questions there in the comment section. And someone, there are a lot of young professionals who, who, who are on our page, who reply to a lot of students so that we can help and make this community a global community. So uh, maybe Gautam uh, have like concluding remarks and then uh, we would like to go towards the end of the session. Yes, again, thank you. Again, we have all a short time. I, you know, I can go for hours. I <laughs> you know people who know me, they know that I love talking to young people and we talk about all kinds of, you know, I, I could not talk at length about technological aspect of all these, you know, the, the details. And that's why the questions, as you said, a lot of antenna questions and others. Um, you can, as Tushar said, you can post them on mtt.org page and I will be trying to answer in, uh, some of them and other professionals will answer your questions. It is there. But at the end of the day, I, again, I want to you know, end with this uh, look around, be a global uh, citizen, uh, you know, be a good human being. If you look around the world, what is going on is very, very important to be you know, socially aware of because whatever technology we do, science we do, we do it for human beings. So if we are not really contributing to our society in many respects, then what are you doing? So that is one of the questions that should drive your life. Work hard. That I mean, uh, of course, I'm saying obvious things, right? Work hard because you'll have to really. There is no alternative. It, no shortcut. No shortcut. Uh, there is no free lunch. Uh, absolutely, there is no shortcuts. You'll have to work hard. I hear sometimes, you know, particularly in India, a lot of parents say, you know, my uh, my son or my daughter is so smart, but uh, you know, doesn't work. You know, uh, as if they are proud about it that they're smart, but they're doing so well in their uh, classes and in school, but they don't work hard. I always tell them that if they apply to uh, my group, I'm not going to hire them because it's not about smartness. It's about attitude. It's about your, uh, you know, that, uh, that quality of your life. That Every day I wake up in the morning, I never felt that, oh, I'll have to go to work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it, this is, I, I, I'm blessed in that way. Uh, that I got this opportunity of exciting work uh, environment uh, uh, where people like David, Nasser, all of the work. So I look forward to meet them every single day. Uh, so that way, my message to you is that try to become a good human being. And that should be your you know, primary, mo primary motivation. And along the way, if you do some good work, fantastic. Thank you. Only one thing I disagree with Gautam here, you can get free lunch. I, uh, Gautam bought me a free lunch if you work hard. So. <laughs> and, and, and now you know that he's organizing this, you know, it just, uh, was it a free lunch? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining and uh, please uh, type in uh, your comments and we will be bringing more of these public lectures in upcoming weeks. Uh, we are working, uh, uh, we have been, uh, Gautam is helping us and other uh, senior members from IEEE MTTS to bring some of the best leaders, uh, uh, scientists and engineers uh, across the globe and uh, we will be having more such live conversation. So with that, thanks for joining and we will meet you guys probably in upcoming uh, couple of weeks or next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Tushar. You are the best. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, we had a huge uh, set of people who joined around uh, 2,000 registrations and 
we had live participation on Facebook as well as WebEx. Uh, so like Tushar said, we're looking forward to come again with a more, uh, you know, interesting personality next time. Uh, and uh, watch out at uh, mtt.org website as well as our Facebook page for updates. Thank you, Aisha. Take care.